This is Polyamory Weekly, tales from the front of responsible non-monogamy from a pansexual, kink-friendly point of view. A warning for our under-18 listeners, this is an adult-oriented podcast about really lascivious things like communication and honesty in relationships. If you're under 18 and looking for upfront advice and answers to questions about sex, please visit scarletteen.com. This is Polyamory Weekly, episode 518, from May 21st, 2017, coming up on today's show. That Polyamory article in the New York Times Magazine, it's coming up on today's show. Hello, everyone. I am your host, Minx, coming at you with a fairly special edition of Polyamory Weekly. This is the Gonzo edition. Wasn't going to publish this week, but with the Poly article in the New York Times Magazine and its shortcomings, pretty difficult to resist doing that. And you'll find out more in the main segment, which I'm just going to skip to right this second. And I am thrilled to welcome back to the studio Kevin Patterson and Ruby Bowie Johnson to talk about that very interesting article in New York Times Magazine last week. Welcome, folks. Hey, thank Hello. you. And for those who may not have tuned in and heard your lovely voices before, would you care to introduce yourselves? Ruby, want to talk about who you are and what you work on in terms of Polly? Yes. Um, my name is Ruby Johnson. I'm a sex therapist in Dallas, Texas. And I work with couples and families and individuals and polycules and all that who are uh, having either particular issues, want to improve things. Also, I run Poly Dallas Millennium Symposium. It's our third one. And our theme this year is Power, Anarchy, and Equality in Polyamory. And we center people of color. Over 70% of our speakers are people of color. And of course, um, Minx, you are our afternoon keynote. And Kevin's doing a lovely workshop. Yeah, I'm excited and honored to be there. And Kevin? Uh, yeah, my, my name is Kevin Patterson. I am. I run a blog called Poly Role Models. It is an interview series for people to express their true experiences with polyamory, what they do good, what they do poorly, how they got into it, origin stories, things that they've done wrong, and how they've rebounded from those things that they've done wrong, and also... Um, and also what self-identities are important to them and how those self-identities impact their polyamory. And I've been able to spin it into some speaking engagements, including up to and including Poly Dallas Millennium, where I'll be hanging out with you two. I know, we all get to hang out uh, next month, I'm very, or July, I guess. <laughs> I'm very excited. Me too. Yes. So let's dive in. There was this article in New York Times Magazine on May 11th called, Is an Open Marriage a Happier Marriage? And it was a really big, long piece, uh, giving a lot of um, print space to polyamory, but not necessarily the best examples of polyamory. So the benchmark couple of the article is Daniel and Elizabeth, who were married in the early 90s. And they tell some story about how he got a custom wedding ring made, but uh, his skin reacted with the metal in the ring. So he, he had to take it off. And that somehow became a metaphor for the fact that like marriage wasn't right for him, or maybe this marriage wasn't right for him. And he, you know, wanted more sex and more sexual variety. And, you know, his wife, Elizabeth was like, how much sex does somebody really need? I mean, is this really gonna, is this really gonna work? And so they decided to, um, well, they didn't really decide to open up their marriage. He brought up the nope. idea of an open marriage, and, and they didn't do anything about it. But then at some point, Elizabeth had a friend in a uh, Parkinson's fundraiser group. That relationship turned romantic, but she didn't bother to tell her husband about it <laughs> until he confronted her. And then she said, oh, yeah, well, this is that open marriage thing. <laughs> So what oh, a what what a lovely example of consensual polyamory they decided to, <laughs> you know, lead the story with. So and, ethical. 
Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like, you know, let's just work in the shadows until your husband sniffs something out. That seems like a good way to do things. You know, who, why bother with communication or honesty or transparency? So, Kevin, I understand that um, you were interviewed for this article, along with many other much more experienced poly people. But those- Wait a minute. Was I? Was I in? Was I in this article? I mean, <laughs> wait a second. You were interviewed, but somehow your interview and your positive and intelligent poly experience seems to have disappeared, except for one picture of. Sorry for saying this, but the token black guy with his wife. Like yep. your picture's in there, but your story isn't. I mean, yeah. I, I, I'm just horrified. I mean, if you're going to write a twelve thousand word article. I mean, I understand that reporters don't have the um, the desire to be as inclusive as we do. I know we're sensitive to that, and they interview who they interview. But the thing is, they interviewed you. They interviewed lots of experienced poly couples, not and and people and quads and and polycules, I should say. But none of them made it into the article. It was all a bunch of rank amateurs doing stupid shit. Right? Yeah, and you're you're a, you're a lot less diplomatic about it than I am, and. I mean, as you said, the, the common the common narrative in this uh, in this piece was about you know married couples looking to sp- spice up their unsatisfying marriages, mm-hmm. and even the photos really reflected that. Where the pictures looked really sad, like everyone looked really serious. No one looked like they were enjoying themselves. I, I was interviewed extensively for this article, as were um, like um, Mark Michaels and Patricia Johnson, the, art- uh, the authors of uh, Designer Relationships, Franklin Vo, who wrote um, More Than Two and The Game Changer, and like several other people who were really experienced, really well thought out, people who could challenge this narrative of married couples looking to spice up unsatisfying marriages and almost none of our words made it into the article um carrie well, G- oh. a couple of your words made it in yeah yeah um <laughs> you you had a very um insightful comment about a parking space and that's all that made it in yeah according to according to the author who i who i got a chance to speak to after this article came out those were actually her favorite her favorite words in the article was my quote about how much i hate people parking in my parking space and it's true like i i'm a very even tempered person i don't really have a lot of ups or downs hots or colds but if you park in my parking spot i lose my shit almost completely (laughs) but there's so much more to my polyamory than that parking spot that that had zero impact on the themes of the article and that was really disappointing well yeah you weren't actually those were the only words of yours that appeared in the article yes and you know if she did a full interview with you i you know i understand that reporters don't have the same goal as activists when writing a story. I get that. I do. But it really bugs me that she opted to interview experienced poly people, but not use that because I guess she somehow, like, I guess she decided her angle was confused people go poly in a really lackluster way. And that was the article. And and so your, your success story didn't really fit in with that article. Is that the same feeling you got, Ruby? Yes, absolutely. That is the same feeling that I got. It's more of a sensational experience that she wanted to have um, or the article to have, in my humble opinion. Um, She wanted to follow through. It, It was the more that I have reflected upon it, the more that I think the expectation was it not to be successful. You know, unconsciously, our biases can get moved, can move into everything that we do. And it may not have even been conscious, you know, um, but I think it's very sad that the people who are experienced, the the people who are, uh, you know, have great knowledge, it was basically, fuck you. Thank you for all of what you said and did and the hours that I spent with you and took you out. But hey, that wasn't good enough. You know, I want some drama, uh, you know, so that's my opinion. <laughs> yeah. I said a whole lot there, I know. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's true. I, you know, I kind of feel like it's, um, 
you know, healthy relationships are boring. So, you know, maybe that's why you didn't make it into the article. But really, yeah, shake it up. But really, seriously, <laughs> why? I mean, could they at least have let people smile? It's like they told the people in these pictures when they took pictures of these, you know, couples and triads and whatnot, nobody's smiling. It's like they told them you can't smile. I mean, I took, I, they took so many photos. They came to my home. Um, I, I'm, I'm based in the Philadelphia area. They came all the way down from New York. They took a lot of photos in my living room. They took a handful of photos in my bedroom and they took what must have been the saddest possible picture of my wife and I. My friends were shocked where one of my friends said it's the saddest they've ever seen us. And another one said that had they not seen the article, had they just seen the photos, they would have assumed there was a photo. Of, it was a, a story about divorce. And I can't really argue. Like my wife and I look like we're getting ready to divorce in that picture. Like, baby, baby, please take me back. That's what my photo looks like. <laughs> and, you know, all the photos are like that. If you look at the other photos, everybody's like very serious and like staring at camera or staring off camera. And I guess they were, I don't know if they were trying to get a, like a serious tone and that's why they decided not to show anyone smiling, but it looks, you know, it's like they tried to stage people like a perfume commercial or something. Right. <laughs> I, I don't, I don't know what that was, but. It's um, like they were trying yeah. to be avant-garde, you know, yeah. and, <laughs> and it fell flat on their face. I mean. Yeah, that's sort of um, that's uh, in, in, in speaking with the writer afterwards, because, uh, you know, I wrote my follow up piece and I I tagged the writer on on Twitter and said, hey, have you read this? And we got a chance to speak about it afterwards. And they said they said that, uh, you know, they didn't really have a say in the photos, but that's what they felt. They felt like it was an artistic magazine and they got artistic pictures. But it was <laughs> it was really a matter of intent versus impact where as you said as you said Minx she didn't write it trying to be an activist she was just trying to come at it from her own view and in doing that it became a very homogenous very whitewashed uh telling of the same story we've already heard yeah i think the part that offends me the most is that your photo is plunked right down in the middle of daniel and elizabeth's story Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and you're not mentioned anywhere else. I mean, well, no, no, no. There's, there's a. My wife gets a single line of of, of text <laughs> <Okay>. that matters, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> All right, fine. A little bit. <laughs> you know, it was kind of like black person check next. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I, I just thought that was a just a classic textbook case of tokenism. I thought. Yeah, I mean, and I don't, and like I said, in, intent versus impact. I don't know whether she meant for us to be the token black couple, but it wouldn't have looked any different whether we were or we, or we weren't. You know, they, they used our faces. They used almost none of our words. Our words would have contradicted the main narrative, but we didn't get any of that. And then you had, um, there was the, a one gay, there was one gay couple. Their photo was them looking away from each other, you know? <laughs> Yeah, and a, the w a lot of the photos are couples looking away from each other or into the distance, and, and none of into I don't the middle think, distance. I don't think any wistfully. of them. I think there's one where 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 two of the people are actually looking. I, I shouldn't say couples because they're not all couples, but I think there's one where two of the people are looking at each other. But mostly, they're I guess they're trying to be artistic. Nope, no, that one they're not looking at each other. They're looking at the paper. So. <laughs> Again, I feel like it's a perfume commercial where people are like running away from each other in a dramatic format or something. But yeah. So Ruby, what was your I know you wrote a follow up piece to this article as well. What was can you share with us the gist of that? Um, yes, I did write a follow up piece. The title of it, if I remember correctly, what the New York Times neglected to see. Um, and within the article, I actually discuss a lot of the beautiful things that polyamory can offer you outside of, you know, fucking outside of drama, outside of chaos. I mean, there is so much more, the sense of community, the sense of co-parenting, um, merging finances together, you know, it's let's move beyond polyamory one-on-one. -on -one. And let's move into polyamory 201. Let's get to the bachelor's degree and actually talk about what is right within these uh, relationships, because there are a lot of beautiful things that happen. And that was my main issue, is that it was focusing on 
the sensational, you know, starting a, um, a relationship and just the ugliness of it. Yeah, it really seemed problem based. That it mm-hmm. was, you know, yes. all, all of the marriages seemed to be troubled to begin with. So mm-hmm. every and and the tr- the marriages that weren't troubled to begin with somehow magically didn't make it into the article. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So if you only read this article, you would think that, oh, look, if my marriage is fucked up, let me try Polly. <laughs> 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 Maybe that will help. Yeah. Uh, but the good news is there was a follow-up article a week later on May 18th. In that first article, there was actually a form that people could fill out with their um, names and contact information, and they could tell their Polly story. And that article, uh, an anthology of those stories, came out on May 18th called We Choose Each Other Over and Over Because We Want to. Readers Share Their Open Marriage Stories. And I admit I haven't read this in its entirety, but it's a tad more representative than the first article. I'll say that. What was your impression of this article? Well, personally, um, when I read it, it was it was nice to see that they had a um, couple who had been married for 40 years. Mm -hmm. Um, They had a, you know, a lesbian couple. They had uh, I couldn't really tell the ethnicity, but they had several couples that were a lot more beyond the couple centric. Um, not couples, but a lot more uh, relationship polycules, networks that are were a lot more beyond the couples. But what really bothered me is the very last vignette that they offered. It was about two couples who were verging on divorce, but they ended up getting together and staying married. So oh, nice. just had to have it there. Hmm. <laughs> What was your take on this, Kevin? Um, I didn't get a chance to read it in its entirety either, but um, I like oh, the the basis of my work is people telling their own stories in their own words, you know, everyone expressing their truth. And that's something I preferred over how the, um, how the New York Times, the, the main article sort of handled it, where instead of having a writer sort of giving us our truth or interpreting our words or leaving, you know, picking and choosing what to leave in. I like the idea of people telling their own truths. And that was, that's very important to me. And realistically, it's, it's sort of a symptom of a, of a larger problem where, um, Chrissy Raymond Holman of, uh, Open Love New York recently got contacted by another video production company about making a polyamory documentary or something. Mm. And they also wanted to focus on married couples in newly open relationships. And when she told them how limited their scope was and offered ways to make it more comprehensive and more honest, they balked at the idea. They, they had a narrative they wanted to run with and they didn't, they wouldn't hear anything otherwise. And that's exactly how this, how this article, this main New York article, New York Times article handled the same thing. So. Anything where it's people telling their own stories in their own words, I am all about that. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, I was skimming over these there, you know, there are a couple, I've seen at least one where, you know, Polly didn't work for that person. And it's like, okay, well, you know, that's fair. Sometimes people try Polly and it doesn't work for them and they're monogamous and then they're happy and that's great. Yeah. So I, I do like that. I still feel that uh, solo polys aren't represented. Yes. It's always married couples. Sometimes they go a little crazy and they'll let a gay couple couple be covered. But it is pretty limited. And I, you know, I'm not sure what to do about that except to keep sort of hounding this. And, you know, when a, when a journalist calls us to say, you know, hey, there are things that don't look like that. Here are some different types of poly relationships. And. They'll probably ignore us, but maybe at some point one of them will listen to us. And yeah, you present know. something a little more diverse. Did we already talk about Kevin's follow-up article? Did we? Let's talk about your follow-up article. I wrote a follow-up article from the perspective of someone who was in it, who was mostly left out of it. And I want to start by saying that I went back to my own bedroom. I put on the same clothes. My wife put on the same clothes. And we took another photo of us looking as happy as we usually look in that sa- in the same place as a, <laughs> as a sort of contrast to the New York Times piece. But the basis of the article I wrote was... 
the stories of unhappily married people opening up relationships, uh, even by way of infidelity, that is a story that needs to be told, but it's a story that's always told. And it's always a story told from the outside looking in, almost always. Um, and there's, there's, that doesn't serve anybody to change any minds because if you look through the comment section of, of that New York Times article, if, uh, if, whether, on the website or on like the Facebook portal to the, uh, to that article. It's mostly people just saying, well, you can tell which one of these people is really into it and which one isn't because they're just trying to keep their marriage together. You, you know, it's always somebody who just wants this, their cake and eat it too. And all these, all these pre-assigned narratives. And if this was an article that was supposed to be about opening it up and demystifying polyamory, it just followed the same exact lines and told the same exact story and got the same exact reaction. And which was the most disappointing part about it, where, you know, in this, this video company that, that contacted, um, Chrissy Raymond Holman, they said, this is the story we want. But in this New York Times article, they got so, they got such a wide variety of stories, but they just left them out. It'd be different if you didn't have the resources or the research, but if yeah. you do and you just leave it on the cutting room floor, what's that even about? Who does that serve? Right. Apparently it serves nope. their readers, nope. but not nope. the poly nope. community. Yeah. And I, <laughs> and I do want to drop a note that Kevin's article posted on a platform in HuffPost, and it actually got a promoted um, rating which means that it was some one of the most read articles. This, Yay, this is new information awesome. for me. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> I'm so proud of you. I oh, can just thank dance. You. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, so I'll have and I'll provide a link to that um, to Kevin's article and to Ruby's article as well as the two articles we talked about in the show notes. Um, so for those who would like to continue the conversation, either online or with you two folks, why don't we share how people can get hold of you guys? Ruby? You can reach me uh, on my email address, um, rubyjohnsonlcsw at gmail.com. I am also available um, at polydallasmillennium.com, and that's for our symposium, which is July 14th. Through the 16th, 2017, here in Dallas, Texas. Early registration ends May the 30th. Um, we have a whole lot of people that are going to be there. We have Minx. We have Kevin. We have Christopher Smith. We have um, Bianca Lorano. We have Ignacio Rivera. We're going to have Thorn Tree um, Press there. Oh, um, awesome. Yeah, we have the Voyerotic Carnival, which is a a kinky circus carnival. So it's going to be a whole lot of oh fun. Oh my God, that's all so fun. <laughs> yes, yes. It's going to be a whole lot of fun. A whole lot of hedonism. That's what they think we do anyway. So. <laughs> yeah, they don't know that I go to bed at nine every night. <laughs> right? <laughs> Put that in your article. <laughs> hey, Kevin, where can everybody find you and your amazing blog? Oh, well, I, my blog is uh, Poly Role Models, which you'll find at polyrolemodels.tumblr.com. Uh, there's also a Facebook portal, which is Poly Role Models, uh, which is pretty easy to find. I'm pretty accessible there. Uh, I'm Poly Role Models on Twitter, Poly Role Models on Instagram. And I just opened up a Poly Role Models Patreon page where my blog is still going to be a free resource. But if you'd like to support uh, the true stories of, of, pe of pe the people of polyamory with generous representation of people of color, LGBT folks, people with disabilities, people from all across the spectrum, um, feel free to throw a couple dollars uh, in support of of some real stories told by real people doing it really. And if you don't remember the terrorist twin, if yes, and <laughs> if and in real space outside of digital space, I'm going to be at uh, Atlanta Poly Weekend speaking first weekend in June. I'm going to be with Ruby and with Minx at Poly Dallas Millennium. Um, I will be at uh, Woodhull Sexual Freedom Summit in August. I will be at Catalyst Con in Los Angeles in September. Ooh, I'll see you there too. Party oh, yes. girl. Party boy, I should say. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm all over the place. Well, you he is are. pretty enough 
to be a girl. I I like to believe so. Yes. There you go. <laughs> well, Kevin I, I and Ruby, be thanks so, so much for recording about this twice because. Yeah. I fucked up the first recording. So thank you for coming back and recording about this again. And enjoy the rest of your lovely weekend. Yeah. All right. Thank Take you. it easy. And thanks to Ruby and Kevin for jumping on a call at a very inconvenient time of day so that we could talk about this very prominent piece of coverage and what we need to do to help journalists understand polyamory a little bit better and maybe be a tad more representative, if at all possible. And with that, I am going to get off mic and we are going to drive back to Seattle from Walla Walla and continue the grieving process. Thanks everyone for listening. And remember, it's not all about the sex. (laughs) 